Frequency and vibration is the substance of all things. We are all musicians in a cosmic orchestra. Our goal is to journey through the powerful, mysterious world of music to awaken, align, and elevate life force energy for the mind, body, and soul. This is a sacred space for you to tap in, tune up, vibe out, while we dive deep into the inner sanctum of creativity. We invite you to accept this invitation to explore, expand, experience, and elevate with these serious vibes. Welcome to Serious Vibes. Once again, we're here to dive in deep, to drop into where the unknown is happening, and the unknown in the darkness, and the beauty of music. We're talking about the vibration of the universe, the way the atoms come together, the way the neutrinos and the particles, the subatomic particles come together, creating sacred geometry called us. We are vortex. We are instruments. Huh. And it is about our song and what we're singing and what instrument we're playing. We're all musicians. So we welcome you all into this sacred space with the serious vibes. And today, I have a very good friend, a mentor, a teacher. He, we may not even realize that he's a teacher of mine. I've learned a lot just from watching him and playing with him on stage and, you know, watching his creative process and how he places things in the field, you know, and, uh, and watches those seeds grow. And it's beautiful to have him here. He's a Grammy nominated, you know, he's a producer, he's a writer, he's a composer, an engineer, a director, an arranger. And he's just a beautiful person. And he comes from a, a very famous family, so we'll get into that a little bit. <laughs> but I'm just glad that I was able to catch him. Yes. You know, and, uh, you know, see what he's doing and just have him, you know, invest a little time with us. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Kenneth Crouch. How you doing, man? I'm dandy, sir. How are you? I'm wonderful. Amazing. Good split difference. You know what I'm saying? It's phenomenal to be here with Full you. Full bar, baby. And to see you after so, such yes. a long time, you know? Yes, sir. But um, uh, we were just talking, you know, actually before, we, we, we saw each other down on the street just yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. And we should have had the cameras rolling all the way up the steps into the room because it's been deep, it's been emotional, and it's a lot of, you know, energy right now that is that is impacting us all. And we're yeah. all unpacking yeah. at this particular time. And it's okay to let go. It's okay to be, to be, to be open and be real and to be authentic. So this is about authenticity. You know, and with music, it's always about being authentic. Yeah. Being your real self, not yeah. just following everybody else. Right. Going with a sample, a loop, or modeling. You know, being you, being yourself. You know, it takes courage to be yourself, though, it does. I think. It does. You know, especially when you have town criers telling you, well, this is what this is, and this thing is hot, and this thing is that. And, you know, it's like you got to just be honest to what it is that the music and the thing is, is telling you. And to know that maybe what it is that I'm doing right now, or that we're doing right now, maybe it may only hit 10 people. But we we can't um, we can't dictate how what we do is going to hit people. All you know, I have a saying that that I wrote. I'm just like, we're not in charge of other people's epiphanies. All we can do is just do what we do and do it with honesty, and then the seeds fall where they're supposed to fall, and then it's their job to go ahead and water it. But in like you know, we're we're uh, we're like geothermal hot springs of love and uh and um and wonderment and creativity and hopefully people can catch the spill yes that's beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> you know yeah so let's go back let's go back All into right. how you got started in music i know you're from a famous family yeah you know a little bit about you know your background and how yeah. you how you tapped into this this spring of music this river this flow this ocean of sound yeah well um you know, I don't really talk about it that much. But my uncle, I, my my grandfather was a bishop, 
and my great uncle was a bishop of the Church of God in Christ. Samuel Martin Crouch was my great uncle, who was appointed by Charles Harrison Mason, who was a founder of the Church of God in Christ. My granddaddy, Bishop B.J. Crouch Sr., um, was a bishop, and then um, and then from there is my father Benjamin Jr., what they call him Benny, and then my uncle Andre Crouch, and his twin, my aunt Sandra Crouch, and. Andre was absolutely uh, my benchmark of excellence, uh, of rock and roll, of just swag, of just tapping into like into the ethos in a split second. And it's, and it's things that I know as a kid, but I'm starting to understand more so now. I get to hear him with two sets of ears. <laughs> I get to hear him when I listen to records. I get to hear him. I, I get the same excitement of when I heard him, like when I was like seven or eight. And it's like, and now I'm 58. And I get to hear him with child ears. And I get to hear him as a fellow artist, musician at the same time. Wow. And then I'm like, man, he was definitely reaching and searching. And we never get there wherever there is. But that's the that's the beauty of it all, is that we're not supposed to know in our knowing. Yes. And the more we know is that we don't know. And that's great. And we dance in the dark. And wow. the dark is dope. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> And that's a that's a bar right there. The dark is dope. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, man? I mean, you know, especially like coming from a church background, you know, um, one would say that, you know, the dark is this and it's evil and stuff like that. And, you know, we have we have um, we have both in, in all of us. Mm -hmm. And it's knowing how to tell the line and knowing that it's there and knowing how to tap into it and make something beautiful out of it. And I'm just so fortunate and blessed and grateful and happy that I'm, like I told you earlier before, that Rip Van Winkle is, is waking up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm waking up with my eyes wide closed or, you know, wide closed, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, you know what, I like I'm, I'm, just, I'm just happy, bro. I'm happy and it's, and there's so much that we don't know. And if we just have the courage just to strike out, it's, it's a great thing because it's not just for us. It's for us to share with other people, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I'm just a humble, happy vessel right now, man. I like this, the way you say, you know, to strike out. Because when we have the word strike out or the statement, sometimes we think of it in a disagreeable way. Mm. But also striking out is yeah. taking what's in you yeah. and putting it out. Yeah. How many things do we have sometimes sitting in the basement that we're afraid to let out? So some of the some of the most creative things were never they were never birthed because people were in whatever mode and they didn't want to tell anybody or they didn't want to show it. But striking out can mean you're the opposite. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or it can be. It can move forward or backwards because everything is tied to its opposite. You can't have dark without light. You can't yeah. have up without down. Yeah. You can't east without west. Yeah. You can All of it. You need that full range. What's on the other side of a black hole? Exactly. <laughs> you know, my granddaddy said that the world's greatest untapped resource is the graveyard. Yes. Because that's where all the dreams die. Wow. That's deep. That is. That's deep. But then maybe I'm thinking maybe that's just where they died with you. Mm. Because what I'm realizing is that I think we talked about it before and I'm I'm sharing it now, but my father asked me at 10 years old if I knew what parallel universes were. And when he said that, I was terrified. I said no, but I knew exactly what it was. And I knew not because I knew, but I knew because I knew. Hmm. And he explained to me, he's like, you know, like how we're here right now. You see where's this tribe, you see the lights and everything. But the other stuff that's even more real than that, that's what we know. 
You know what? And who was it? What did Bruce Springsteen Bruce Springsteen say? It's like we're dancing in the dark. Yes. You know, and that's really what it is. So all that to say, he asked me if I knew what parallel universes are, and he explained it to me. And he's like, you know, we're we're here now, and then there's like another, you know, there's another. Um, civilization or whatever going on that we're in that we can't see. And I said, do you believe that? And he said, yeah. So I just said, wow, here's a guy that grew up in church and he understood that. So the point that I'm making is maybe he didn't live out that dream, but because he said the stuff to me, Maybe that's his dream. Maybe he just passed the baton on to me. Yes. And I see that with my kids. I see that with Sophia, which means wisdom, and my son Nicholas, which means czar, victor of the people. Because I think that words are and, 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 and names are really important. And I think that the, one of the best things we can do, I told my kids, I said, I'll support you in anything that you do. As long as it's legal, if you want to be a trash man, if you want to, you know, be a horticulturist, you know, or whatever, I'm, I'm with it. Yes. You know? Yes. Yes. Wow. So when you were young, about yeah. how long, because, you know, by the way, you know, I didn't say it, but Kenneth Crouch is one of the most amazing pianists, not just a keyboardist, a pianist that I know. And uh, I always say that, you know, Kenneth plays the whole piano. I, I, do. I, I don't know if I've ever seen him. Because, you know, some people, they stay in one area. Yeah. That's their area of comfort. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I've watched you play the whole piano. I've watched where you ran out of notes, you know, to bottom. I'll play the piano like a cajon or, or, or like, you know, a cascara, you know, because yes. it's like, it's a percussive instrument, too. Yes, yes it is. It and is. it's a harp. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's interesting that you know we 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 come together because you know I always my thing was I watched I I really loved Donny Hathaway yeah and the way he and Earl Deruyn the percussionist mm. had this thing yeah because the the Wurlitzer piano yeah has a special relationship with the sound of the conga wow I never realized it because see Wurlitzer it's kind of almost a little flat yeah. Um, it's kind of buttery, like foie gras. Exactly. It's a buttery sound. Yes. Yeah. And I always love that. You know, all my all my pianos I have now are all Wurlitzers. Wow. I got like three Wurlitzers. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Old yeah, yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. And I, I really watched the way Donny Hathaway and Earl Deruyn were like right at each other. The congas were up in the front, and they had a thing, and you know, Donny was playing the keyboard yeah, like man. in a percussion way. Yeah. I, I love that. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes things happen in our childhood Yeah. that spring forth who we are now. Yeah. That affected me. Yeah. You as a child, when, do you remember you first putting your hands on the, on the piano? How old were you? Oh, wow. When did you start? So I started when I was about, I think, six or seven. Somebody from church said to my mother, they said, look, we have this piano. It was a warlet, sir. Acoustic, spin it. Wow. A Wurlitzer. Wow. Crazy. Full circle. So anyway, they said, look, they, they, they loaned us the piano like for years. And I started taking piano lessons. And like for the first year, I wasn't getting it. Kind of like how I was in school. I would be kind of a... Okay, I could be self-deprecating. I was kind of yellow bus, kind of slow at times. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then, <laughs> yellow like this. But once I would catch it, then I would be like at the head of the class. And so my my, my teacher, Miss Myers, Miss Lorna Myers was my, was my piano teacher. She was really patient with me. And she told my mother like right at 11 months, she said, she said I don't know if he's going to catch it, but if he doesn't, Maybe get him art lessons or something like that. But my mother never told me that. She never, thank God, she never like discouraged me. And somehow in that 11th hour, <laughs> somehow in that 11th hour, I got it. Like, it just, when you stop trying and you start being, 
So I just started to be it. Mm. But I didn't realize that I was being it. These like downloads are like coming coming to me now. But that's Say that what again. it was. Stop trying and start being and start being. Put a pin in that. Yeah. So, and then I remember so that I went through like some years of just like listening to music and listen to a lot of gospel and if, and then you know I wasn't allowed to like listen to like secular music of course you know growing up in in the household with my that was definitely on my on my mother's side you know like okay that devil music and stuff like that and but I can just remember like just hearing music and hear like the Hawkins and hear like my uncle and it would just tear my heart out. Cause it's like, I got to the point where music, when I would play, I know I'm kind of all over the place, but it got to the point where I would play and I said, music is the most honest thing to me and it knows how to say everything I don't know how to articulate. Mm. So I can literally put my fingers like that and I can just, I can already hear what this sounds like here. I can put my fingers down and it will always be right. It doesn't matter where I am on the piano because the feeling that I'm putting out here is right. And I remember talking to people at 1500 with Lawrence, the, 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 uh, univ the university he has up the street. I did like a little pop-up thing with the kids. And I just said, you know what? There's no wrong notes. You have to learn the basic rules, whatever the rules are, but then once you realize the rules, you throw it away. And then you dance on the, on the stars, you know, thereafter. It's knowing how to trust that when I put my fingers like this, I can feel B flat, I can feel A flat, I can feel G, I can feel C, I can feel E flat, I can feel C here, I can feel C, G, B flat. So that's a big cluster. I know what that sounds like. And especially if I play that on the wordless, sir, I know how brown it sounds. Yes. How we were talking about synesthesia. Yes. I don't have synesthesia, but anytime I play a, a chord that really resonates with me, I'm like, okay, it's brown. It just feels brown. And maybe the brown is the dark of the dirt. Mm. I don't know. It's the mother. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I so I took so, a lesson. Okay, go ahead. So after that, like, you, yeah. you, what was like your first record that you recorded on? Do you remember? Jesus. Yes. I was at my younger Jackson's house. Percussionist. Yeah, man. Yes. And it was uh, Tony Haynes. Hmm. You know Tony? Yeah, Tony. I was at Manyungo's house, and I was like 16, I think. And I'll never forget, he did a song called Rockin' in the USA, and he had a little British Union Jack flag, mm -hmm. and he sang this song in an English accent, and it was called Rockin' in the USA. And I'm like, man, I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. That was my first session that I did. That is what I remember. Wow. At Manyungo's house, in his studio, and that was, shit, what, 40 years ago? Wow, wow. Yeah, so Tony Haynes was my, was he was the first cat who I did a recording session with. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So just for our audience, name some of the records that you've either written, played on, some of the artists that you've worked with. I know there's a pretty big list, but give us some of the highlights uh, of that. Uh, let's see. So I'll just kind of smash them all in together. So yes. my uncle, Andre, uh, Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston, Lenny Kravitz, Eric Clapton, Mark Anthony, all of the Jennifers. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, Ty Dolla Sign, uh, Terrence Martin. Uh, God, who else? Um, Wow, Bob Dylan, Bonnie Raitt, B.B. King, uh, Jimmy Vaughn. Uh, honestly, I, I have to like think because it's like I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting how we met. We had asked, talked about it earlier. Yeah. 
um, as a producer, I was always checking out new studios. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for a place one weekend, and they said, well, there's a place, you know, Studio 54, they might have a little room 56. in there. You can, 56. Yeah. 56. We might have a room in there. And uh, the guy brought us in to show us around, and you were there. Okay. And you were producers with, with Tracy. Tracy. Tracy Kendrick. Yeah. And, um, you know, we met briefly, and we yeah. looked at each other, and I was like, okay, yeah, cool, cool, cool. But it wasn't until later when I was working on the DJ Quick Projects, Yeah. you know, I was producing him. And he said, man, we got this keyboard player coming in. You, gotta, you might like this dude, man. And you walked in the door. I looked at him and said, yeah, I know this guy. <laughs> he was, was Kenneth Crouch. So we uh, met again yeah, yeah, yeah. on the DJ Quick Project. Yeah. I just liked the way you colored. You know what I'm saying? You were putting those colors in there yeah. to make it. Because, you know, my thing at that point was, why do we got to keep using these samples? Yeah. Let's, let's play it, man. Yeah. You know, I know what wah wah pedal they use. I know, man. That's a but that's a blah blah blah. This is a this is a, this is a this is a B three yeah. organ. <laughs> well, yeah. well, let's just get this. No, get the B three. Yes. Get the piano. Get yeah. the actual. That's a get the Mitron biphaser. Get all that. Yeah, all that. <laughs> Excuse me. So you know we were in the in the in the in the in the place of recreating things and then changing them because yeah. my thing was to bring music to it absolutely as a musician yeah you know I didn't want to just you know go with samples right but I just loved the way you you know you had this respect and this calmness and you were listening to what was happening yeah and I said yeah this guy I, I got to stay in touch with him so uh, that's when we connected wow and then I I think at one point I told you I said well I got a studio man come on by and you had that beautiful spec mixer. Oh, man. Come on, man. Look, okay, for the youngsters out there, if you can find one, get yourself a spec line mixer. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Go ahead. And I was using that as the man. front end for my whole, because yes, I had the 16 track, two inch yes, you analog did. recorder, which I still have, by the way. Wow. If you ever want to use it. It's actually being rebuilt right now in wow. Pasadena. You know, that was one of the that was one of the 16 track machines that came from Westlake. That Quincy and Michael used for the off the wall. Wow! I think they said they used 16, 16 track machines all striped. Wow. They used this thing called the Lynx to get them all to work together. Yes, that was one of those machines, and I purchased it. Wow! I actually have the Michael Jackson off the wall analog machine right now in Pasadena, bruh. And all of that music <laughs> is still like, and all of that energy from that is still yes, yeah, yes. We just handed the baton off to you. You see. Yeah, it was crazy. So yeah, I, man. I, you know, a lot of things I just fell into the mics that the, that that Janet did uh, 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 control. Okay, I have the actual mics. Wow, I was like, somebody sold them to me. They said, "Well, man, these are from such and such. You want to buy? What? Yeah, yeah." But it's not just the equipment; it's the vibration the equipment has, Absolutely. and the vibration that you come to it with, and the respect. Yeah. But I remember when you came by the studio, man, you were like, wow, this is cool. And I remember yeah. my whole living room. I remember I that. Like 15, a, my whole house was a recording studio. It really was. We even used the bathroom for echo sometimes, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Put a speaker and a mic in there. But, you know, we. And you worked we, a lot. I think you were on Logic. Then, yeah, weren't you? yeah, I was. Yeah. At, I was at, you know, I was analog for right. a long time. Yeah. I wouldn't go digital. Right. And, you know, they tried to get me to do Pro Tools, and I hated the way Pro Tools sound. I yeah. said, man, I don't like the way it's too, it's, I don't know, I don't feel it anymore. Yeah. I hear it. Yeah. It's loud. Yeah. But I don't feel it. Cause yeah. I, and analog was, is all, I has it. always been my thing. Yeah. But it was Greg T's. From yes, from E Magic. Greg T's from E Magic, who I think now, I don't know if he's still with iTunes. Yeah. For years. But Greg T's yeah. came to me. We, you know, I was working with this artist named Margie Coleman. Wow. And Margie Coleman. Yes. yes. Margie Coleman. In fact, that actually reminds me, we met before this. We met, because you did you play on the Margie Coleman track? I think I did. I think so. That that sounds really familiar. And Margie Coleman was really like truly the first neo soul artist. A lot Without of people don't question. know. Him. That whole thing with the natural hair, yeah. the plants on the stage, yeah. talking about social issues. Yeah. So you might call that woke, you know what I'm saying? But you know, way back then, this was sure. before India and all of them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, you know, it was interesting that, you know, when we when we got together. I was like talking to you about how I how I like to do things, and yeah. I'm, a, I'm a producer where sure. I may not play the instrument, but I can tell you, and I like to urge the energy out of you and tell you what I'm thinking about, Absolutely. where it's going, yes, and knowing which which instrument to put with what vocal, not sure. just what well, this. We need a piano. No, we need a certain person on the piano. And I remember the second musician I met when I moved to California in 1977 was uh, uh, Larry Dunn. 
Wow, from Earth, Wind, and Fire. I met Larry Dunn because my manager, when I was 17, okay. stole my song. <laughs> okay, this is how this goes. I wrote a song. Yeah. It's the only thing I could play on the acoustic guitar. Wow, okay. Doom, doom, doom. Doom, 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 doom. Doom, doom, doom. Dun, 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 dun. I'm playing this, so I go to rehearsal. This is when I'm living in Connecticut. Wow. And I'm playing this, and I, the drummer comes in. I say, man, play a beat. And he starts playing this beat, and I tell the bass player, and we start playing this groove. Yeah. Manager walks in. He says, oh, man, this, what's that, man? He says, a little, you know, a groove you know, that I came up with. He says, oh, man, that's dope. And I had this little portable cassette machine. This is when they finally came out with the little handy dandy one. Mm -hmm. He said, "Man, what is that?" I said, "I just picked it up in New York on Forty Second Street." He says, "Man, put a cassette in there and play and, and record it." So we're recording it. Dun 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 dun. dun. That's dope, man. That's dope, man. And I, he says, "I want to take it, man. I want to let somebody hear it. Let somebody hear it." I said, well, "Who are you gonna, who are you gonna let hear it?" He says, "Well, you know, I'm best friends with Marvin Kaye." Huh. Said, oh, your best friends are Marvin. Oh, yeah, man. I want to take it up there, too, man. We're supposed to hook, hook up this weekend to play ball. So I'm saying, well, wow, I don't know about that. He says, man, you know, this could be big for you. And I looked at the drummer, and I says, man, what, what should I do? He says, man, you better give it to him, man, because otherwise we, we, we can't take it away. You're going to have to give it up. I wrote on the tape, got to give it up. I give it to my manager. Manager leaves. I don't see him anymore. And this is like 17. The next time I see him is I moved to California, 1977. And at that point, the song Got to Give It Up was gigantic. I was hurt. I remember driving my little Volkswagen one day and just driving along, and the song comes on. Wow. I'm like, what? Yeah. That's my groove. And it's Marvin Gaye. I didn't write the lyrics now. I had nothing to do with that, but the groove. Yeah. My, my manager, Robert Madden, he had Troy Davis, he had all these different names, mm. and he was, a, he was a shyster. Yeah. He even stole the house that we were rehearsing in. Yeah. Come to, he was on the news one day, he stole these people's house. How do you yeah. steal a house? His car, he's, he was a, he was a, you talk about a grifter and a shyster. Right. He was good. Right. And everybody knew him. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I, I go to New York, I mean, I go to L.A., yeah. and I'm going to a convention, one of the yeah. first black music conventions. Oh, like? Um, B.R.E. Uh, Yes. I'm there. I've just moved here. I'm and you young. you see him there. And I see the manager. And I'm ready to go off and go crazy. And he's standing with Earth, Wind, and Fire. And he says, there he is now. That's the guy that wrote Got to Give It Up. He's the original. He's And I'm like, I I'm confused now. Yeah. Said, what the hell do right. I do, man? Do right. I uh, and right. Earth, Wind, and Fire. This is my yeah. idols. Yeah. And he starts inching. Maurice, this is, you know, B, little B, blah, 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 blah. And Larry Dunn, Larry Dunn held my hand. He was like, yeah, bro. Man, good, good work, man. Good wow. work. Me and Larry got tight. We started talking. He says, yeah. I live over in, in Culver City. I said, well, I live in Culver City. Wow. So Larry was the second musician I met, really met and hooked up with here. So, you know, he started playing on a bunch of my stuff. I said, Larry, man, can we do stuff? And I'm just blown away because I got this bad cat. Yeah, man. He's, of course. Know. But I realized that sometimes your idea, you have to let it go. After this convention, this is a very important piece here. I'm standing in the parking lot of the hotel. The convention's yeah. over. And I'm yeah. standing here. He, homeboy, my crooked manager, introduced <laughs> me to everybody. Wow. I met so many people in the music business that yeah. day. It was my mind, I was crying. Cause I get it. I've made it, but I haven't. Right. Right. And he says, so, so look at you, man. Look, 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 look at what you did. He says, yep, I stole your song. He says, you learned about copyrights, didn't you? You learned about publishing. You learned about the industry. I said, yeah, man, I he did. Said you, he said this. He says, wow. if I wouldn't have stole your song, you might not know. He says, so now you've learned. And he said, look at all the people you met today. Wow. And he That's said, a bold and he says, and he says something interesting. He says, he says, you're a little high, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I got a few habits. He says, yeah. If you had received the $20 million <laughs> at 21 years old, you'd be dead because you had no self-control. So he... <laughs> and, I, I, and, he, and he walks away. Yeah. I'm standing there crying because yeah. I learned that, yeah, you've got to give things up. You've got to give up the drugs. You've got to give up bad habits. You've got to be ready wow. to let things go, let people go. So, you know, that opened up a whole new door for me. And I realized that we as musicians have to begin, as artists, put it out. Yeah. Even though you might not make any money, you're going to get something from it. And I, I, you know, I just look at you because like your music has opened the door for so many people. Your sound, just you playing, 
Wow, You're a door that's, opener. Wow. So I'm just telling Billy you now. Higgins, Billy Higgins said that to me, too. I used to play with him a lot right down the street at uh, the World Stage. Yes. And Billy and I, we were just playing duets by ourselves over the World Stage. And um, Cornell Fowler told me, he's like, man, he goes, Billy always says, yeah, man, Crouch, when he plays, he opens doors. Yeah. That was Billy Higgins who played with, who did, well, think about the stuff that he did. He did like, um, like with uh, Ornette Coleman and Charlie Hayden. And he was a guy that when I would play with him, he was the first drummer that I heard the melody. I never heard a drummer play melodic. Yeah. And I'm listening to him and I'm playing and my, imagine playing and then you're having an epiphany at the same time. But you still got four more bars to go. Yeah. So I'm playing. I'm just like, what is this? So I'm, 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 I'm I've got duality going on here. It's like I gotta, pl- I gotta keep playing the song. But yeah. But anyway, yeah. I just have to interject that. Yeah. Interesting thing. Um, when we played together with Byron Miller. Yeah. And we played for months and months, you know, up in we Pasadena. We did. Absolutely. And we were the band, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And it was, Absolutely. I was always right next to you because I yep. felt like I was Earl DeRuin. <laughs> man. You know, and you'd be playing some stuff, man. And one night you started playing this solo. I'll never forget this. And something happened. It's like all of a sudden the drinks, you couldn't hear the drink, t- you know, the glasses tickling at the bar. The band dropped away. You were playing some stuff. And it's like I couldn't really see. It's like you were blending in yeah. and out of the space, like you were yeah. going into another dimension. I always do that. And you were playing something, and I remember you did something, you played some real deep note and held it. I just, that's all I remember. And you were at the top of the keyboard playing something, you were just holding this note, and I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. I remember that. That was, was at like, Red, White, and Blues. That Red, rem- White, and yes. Blues. It was like, what is, what the hell, is he gonna let go of this note? Like, but you were playing something, I was like, oh my God. And I remember saying to myself, I wish the drummer would stop playing. Yeah. Because the drummers would always want to just play. You don't need to play all this. Yeah. But you were like, and I was like, oh, my God. I was so inspired. So me, I was always the percussionist that held down the rhythm. You put a lot of glue together. My thing was just, let me just hold it all together. Y'all play whatever you want. I don't need to solo. Because I was always nervous about soloing. But you were the rue that really held a lot of that stuff together because it's like you had like the whistles and and you had all this stuff and it was so, so tasteful. A lot of times, so sometimes if, 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 if you're playing with a percussionist, it's like, are you really adding to what's going on or are you just like, I got some congas and I just want to play, play. It's like, yeah. but it was, you would sit there. It was almost like listening to like a talking drummer, mm-hmm. you know, cause you would sit there and it was like, you know, you have like, like the hurdy gird. Well, not the, yeah, like the, uh, yeah, yeah. you have that. sound tubes. Yeah. Yeah. Sound and the monkey. Tube. Remember the monkey? Wait. Remember I had the little monkey and I would beat You sure did. It was a toy. You bet you sure did. I used did. to spank the monkey. And the audience used to say, spank the monkey. And you would hit this monkey. It was like a little like a little dial. Yeah. You would hit the monkey and it would go. Yeah. Bah, bah, bah. So I would beat the monkey in rhythm and throw the monkey across the room. People would be but, you know, no, but, but it's like, but that was so you. It's like, because the thing about it, I think that... When we're really good artists or whatever, who we are comes out in what we do. We just have to have the right kind of ears and the right kind of everything to be able to go ahead and tap into it. Yeah. 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 What happened that night? I'll never forget this for the rest of my life. And that's why I say you're one of my teachers. Mm. Because when you opened up this vortex, it said, it's okay. Let go. Yeah. It's not about what they think. It's right. This thing just came over me. And Byron looks at me and he says, B, I just started playing. You know, I always play with three drums because yeah. I'm in the melody, sometimes four. Yeah. And I started playing. And I was going somewhere and I was doing this thing. And I heard you say, yeah, B, that's it. Oh, man, he's, oh, oh, you were, you were like guiding me. And I was, at one point, I was just gone. I was like, out. Oh. I don't know where I was at. Yeah. And my hands were moving, but I wasn't playing them. They were playing me. I get it. 
You changed me that night. Wow. That night. Wow. I just, I mean, I like to thank you publicly. Wow. Because whatever window you opened up, all I did was just walk through it behind you. And it let me know to solo was more about improvisation. Because I used to try to think of what I was going to play instead of allowing it to happen. When it, when it came to solo. Sure. Everything else, I was open, but when it came to me being out front, I didn't want to be out front. I get it. That's why I'd rather be a producer and be in the back and let you go out there and be out front. So, But sometimes that's how we hide, though. Yeah, we hide. And I was a hider. I've been a runner it. and a hider yeah, yeah. a lot in my life. What did Johnny say on a song for you, but then I came out from hiding? What, is that on, what was that on a song for you? And then I came out when I was hiding. It was on time for time. It goes... But it's the hiding lyric. Anyway, yeah. you were, sorry, go ahead. But a lot of us are hiding, and we're running. Yeah. And we're afraid to step out and solo. Yeah. And just be you without all the stuff that you think is you that you've been dragging with you. <laughs> the imposter. All the love, all the luggage. Yeah. Okay, and you know, some of us have the, you know, we, have, we don't want to win because we don't want to make everybody else feel bad. Self-sabotage. We have the loser syndrome, you know, the Bruh. winner syndrome. And it's all these different things. They got titles now. Sure. But for you, brother, when you tap in, where are you going? What do you feel? For folks that are out there right now who are looking to tapping into that infinite cosmic vortex, is there something you do? Is there, Do you have I a be. practice? Do you have a philosophy? You know what? Do you have a prayer? This is how I can how I can how I can describe that. I know the music is, will always catch me. I have a feeling that I'm walking a tightrope, and there's no net underneath. This is what I remember when I would play with you. It was me, you, Byron, Daryl, and Trevor. Yeah. And one thing I knew was this: I knew that no matter how far in the stratosphere I got. Even though there's no net there, if there was a slip up, you guys will always catch me and I could come back to the tarmac. Yeah. So I know that there's something out there, and I know that when I'm that when it's honest, it's right. And there's even times when 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 you're when be playing, and you know, you see girls looking, and that's like, all right, man, you know what? Look, man, fuck all that. It's like, you know what? I'm getting in myself. What is the honesty that I'm trying to play? Mm. And that's the thing. And do you know what? And sometimes playing the honesty doesn't get the applause. Exactly. But you have to know that everything isn't for everybody. We're Basquiat's. Mm. And sometimes people just want a Thomas Kincaid. Mm. <laughs> but when you're a Basquiat, it's like, it's like Walmart or the, or the Waldorf Astoria, you know? You can't get mad that some people don't get it, but it's our responsibility to just be honest. So what I do is like, I know that I don't know, and I trust my bandmates that I'm up there with, and they're going to, we're on this little river together, and I know that when you have, you can, it's like when you go to a barbershop, I can tell how great a barber is before he even cuts the hair. I look at him when he's cleaning it, and you hear like the the, the sound of the clippers, ank 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 ank, and then he brushes the thing off, and then he puts the the toothbrush in the barber side. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's the guy, because you see how he does his tools. Yes. You watch how somebody does their tools. You watch how they put their how they set up. You set up your 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 drums. You set up your congas. You um, how a cat puts on his his hi hat. And how he tunes his drums. And when you have cats, when you hear their excellence, it can be nothing but excellent. It's like you said, like being a producer, it's the right kind of casting. Yeah. But it's also being a shapeshifter that sometimes you might have somebody who may not necessarily, you know, you, they might be Pop Warner. <laughs> But we're NFL, but it's our job to bring them up and be like, okay, and not to like shame somebody, but to play in a way where you're not playing over their head, but you're playing and you're kind of jugging them a little bit, but it's like, 
you're 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 guiding them. You're almost like herding the kittens in a way. <laughs> yeah. But I think that what it is, it's like I trust that the music is always right. I I trust it, and. Also, sometimes it's like who you're with, they might get it and they might not, but but just know that it's doing what it's just, it's doing what it's supposed to do. Wow. So it's about trust. Oh my God. You know the Herbie song, Trust Me, from um, oh God, what's the album is that? Feast Don't Fail Me Now re- record. Layla turned me on to that record. It's like one of the most perfect records. Hmm. Trust me, don't ever be afraid. Why? And the, the, the water sang backgrounds on there. But yeah, you should check that out. You wow. you would dig. Oh my God. And it's like the shaker through like a slow flange. It sounds like a slow train going to, into clouds. Wow. You know? Wow. You know, you mentioned Layla, Layla Hathaway. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, I don't even know if she remembers this, but. My partner Tracy and I mixed her first demo. It was a song. It was actually a track called "Inside the Beat." Wow. She was young, man. And I was like, "This is Donnie's daughter." Yeah. Whoo, man. So, anyway, you know, music is textures. Absolutely. And we are musicians. Absolutely. All of us. Yeah. Even the person that's never touched an instrument. Absolutely. We're we're all musical entities and part of this what I call orchestra or as Sun Ra says orchestra. orchestra, you know, and who you show up as, you know, has a lot to do with who you are. Yeah. Now, a lot of folks they have, you know, they create this whole ID. You know, they create this whole persona. Yeah. And they airbrush and they got, you know, the apps now to make you look like somebody that you're not. So there's a whole lot of this false identity. You know, they, it's like they, they and they really believe it. They're really them. Uh, all, they, they've created an ID, but that's not ideally them. I call it dancing in the algorithm, and it's like it's never, it's not real, you know? Yeah, it's not real. Yeah. And, you know, one thing I love about jazz yeah. is real jazz. I'm not talking about the smooth jazz. I'm talking about <laughs> some real <laughs> right, jazz, which is right. improvisation. Sure. Is that you get to show up, and you get to really play, and it's not... Like the commercial music, you gotta be a certain thing. You yep. gotta sell a certain amount of records. Yep. It's gotta, you yep. gotta have a hook right here. Yep. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And nowadays, you can't even have a bridge anymore. They say you put a bridge in a hit in a pop record today, you're done. Well, not. I shouldn't say pop. I said R&B. Copy. Pop. I listen to the pop station. They playing some yeah. like real stuff. Yeah. You go back to the R&B station. That's like a loop. Which is cool. Right. And people have done some artistic things with loops. Yeah. But I noticed that the commercials are in loops. Yeah. The, the, the weather is in loops. Absolutely. People are loopy. Yeah. They're saying the same thing every yeah. day. It's like, you know, how you yeah. doing? Good morning. Yeah. And you ask, you know, you ask somebody. It's like Groundhog's Day. Just ask somebody, say, well, how are you doing? And if you tell them the truth, they're like, oh, well, well, I didn't ask you all that. But you asked me, how was I doing? If you really want to know. Sure. But with music, we really talk. Yeah. Because when I was when I was young, I couldn't speak publicly. Mm. Even though now I'm a public speaker and all that, I couldn't speak. Yeah. Not publicly. I would speak through. I, I create voices. I get and it. And I had these characters. That's when I used. They used to call me the crazy man. And I created all this stuff because I'd watch George Clinton and I said, Oh yeah, you know. And 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 I remember meeting George. That was deep, you know. Anyway, that's a whole other story. Yeah, yeah. But. We create these characters sometimes when we're afraid to tap into who we are. Exactly. Now is the best time to tap in and be authentic. It sure is. Because you'll stand out. Instead of following the crowd. Instead of doing what somebody else does. And I think I was telling you earlier that, you know, my partner and I were hired to do this track. And they said, we want like the Jimmy and Terry, you know, Jimmy and Terry sound. Yeah. You know, Jimmy, you know, Jimmy Jam and Terry, Terry Lewis. Lewis. Yeah. And I'm like, well, why don't you hire them? Yeah. Now, we want you guys to get that sound. So you want me to go home and study their stuff and do with, why would you call us? Because you don't have the money to pay them. Exactly. And then another time, you know, just t- get that Teddy Riley sound. No, you got to call Teddy Riley because each person has their own unique texture. Exactly. Their own unique yeah. signature. So back in the day, I would always know who to call. Mm. If it was something I'd call Larry Dunn mm. for, for a certain thing, yeah. I would call a Greg Curtis. Yeah. You know, I would call you if I knew that it needed almost like because you're orchestrating. That's what I love to do. Man. You're orchestrating. Yeah. So when I was, uh, you know, when India asked me to produce her. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she heard my project. I had this project called Urban Shaman. 
which right. was the first medicine music. Yes, you did. Yeah, Urban Shaman. It was all about, you know, healing, meditation, Man. you know, and indigenous sounds. Absolutely. And when we worked together, she says, she pulls out this the CD. She says, is this you? I said, yeah, that's me. What are you? She says, this is my favorite CD. You're the Urban Shaman guy, Dr. B. I says, yeah, me and my partner, Akadama. And she was like, oh, my God, I, I, I need to call you. I need to call you. So she called months later because we played together in Washington, D.C. Okay. With the Millions More Movement. Okay. We played with this whole orchestra. I was in charge of the, I was the musical director for what they call the Harmonic Field. Wow. It was an orchestra, Mother Tynetta Muhammad. The, the, she was the wife of Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Her thing was to travel the world and bring music to the world. Wow. So she had people from all over the world playing with her. And she, she asked me to do the harmonic field. I said, well, what is that? She says, tap into the harmonic field. So I brought in this. And this was you said Elijah this Muhammad? Was beef, this was Elijah Muhammad's, one of his wives. Wow. And she was tapped in like that? Oh, she's on a whole nother level, bro. Really? Oh, another level. Wow. Real quick, we'd be doing, we'd be rehearsing. Yeah. And wherever we rehearsed, wherever we'd go, there'd be these weird clouds would pop up on a sunny day. So I said, um, you know, Mother, uh, what's with those funny clouds? She says, oh, those are the planes. I said, what planes? The ships. What ships? Well, you know, my husband and that's my security. I said, what are you talking about? She says, those are ships. She says, those are vapor clouds that hide the ships. And she, okay. said, she says, well, watch this. And she goes, and all of a sudden, this gray disc comes out of the cloud and goes back in. Freaked me out. <laughs> she said, oh, yeah, well, you know, that's, that's, that's a whole other realm. She says, this is real. I said, well, they flying saucers. She says, well, you might. They're, they're planes. I said, where are they from? Out of space. She says, no, they're from here. They made them in the 30s. She mentions the corporations that got together that right. made these discs. Anyway, she brought NDRE in. And she asked a lot of people to come and do this thing on the White House steps. And there's a conductor with a whole orchestra. Yeah. And there's me. And I brought this sister, Def uh, Destiny, uh, Destiny Muhammad, the harpist okay. in the hood from up in Oakland. Okay. I brought her in. This other sister, Tarika, okay. who's a violinist who plays like Hendrix. Wow. And she was actually one of the first Black Panthers. They started wow. the Black Panthers, I think, at her house up in Oakland when the drama went down where they, please kill this kid in the street. So I have all these people that are like part of this harmonic field creating this, this, you know, it was like out there. You know what I'm saying? Sure. That harmonic field. What was interesting was India asked me to produce her. She said, I need that sound on a record. Mm -hmm. I have a sound yeah. that I've never done. I have a song I've never done because I didn't never meet anybody who I think thought could texture this. She said, it's the song got me my deal. It was the song, India song. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I'm like, okay, well, well, let's work. She says, well, call your people. Let's do it. Yeah. And I was like, I got to call. Hold my, hold my. I'm making my list. Kenny Crouch. Huh? I just remember us recording, and you were listening. This is where we're going. So intently to everything, to everybody. Because I, I watch you turn your head. You do That's this what thing. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's turning his head, and he's looking over here, and he's like this. And you always placed the beautiful thing in the spot. Right. And you became very humble, and you knew silence. Right. You knew dynamics. Yeah. And when to be strong. Yeah. And when to, and see that's what I think that a lot of folks could learn is the dynamics of life. Mm. Instead of always pushing yourself and always trying to be famous and always trying to be noticed and just saying something deep just so you can get likes. You know, everybody wants likes now. I gotta talk loud and saying nothing. We got a lot of likes. Likes. Yeah, but what, what, is, do you but like? what does that mean? Yeah, what does that even mean? And if people want this five seconds of fame, so I think we're at a time where we're going so far one way that the opposite is happening at the same time. I notice a lot of musicians. I go to the guitar center, and I'm like, it's full of musicians here on the weekends. Children. I mean, it's crazy. I'm like, so music is not dying. No. Everybody's not just, you know, sampling, pushing buttons. There's people who really would like to play. So for people who are thinking about taking on art mm -hmm. or music, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Where would you say, what would you say to them? What message would you have for the person out there who is contemplating tapping into the creative, their creative self? Listen to everything. Listen to everything. Listen to everything that you like. Listen to everything that you think that you don't like. Listen for the humanity because huh, we're all the same. 
white, black, gay, straight, Republican, Democrat, white supremacist, you know, whatever. The basic things that we want, we want to have food, we want to be able to be with our people that we love, we want to laugh, we want to like dance. And those are the basic things that we that that we have that we need. I say this, what you and I do, I it, this came to me during the uh, pandemic. We're artistic first responders. We're first responders. Art is necessary to keep the shit going because if you think it's fucked up now, it would be even worse if there wasn't art. Art is as necessary as us breathing. And I think a lot of times people can be afraid to make mistakes. Mistakes is where you, uh, that's where you get your wisdom tax from. You got to be a, you got to be willing to go out there and try and to fall and try and fall and try and fall and fall and fall. And then you hit nirvana for like two seconds and you got to learn how to live a lifetime in a split second. Ooh, say that again. You have to learn how to live a lifetime in a split second. Wow. Yeah, that's another one. Yeah, that's deep. But so that means so I read, and how I learned that I used the box right. Hmm. And so my my coach he's like, he said um, he goes okay I want you to do like come on southpaw he's like okay I want you to do like 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 two jabs and a right cross and an up and an uppercut and then I did it and and when I did it. I knew I did it right because it resonated in my body and it felt like music. And I closed my eyes and then he hit me. He's like, keep your head in the game. So while you got all this beauty going on, you still got to keep your head in the game. Woo! Like when I was with Billy Higgins and he's playing all this beautiful shit, but I knew that it's still my job to go ahead and give him bars five, six, seven, eight, because he's still in the middle of saying something. I can't be selfish. You gotta let other people talk. Yes. I heard this cat, this guy named Rabbi Jacobson, and he's like, you know, I got I gotta look it up because this is such a great, this is such a great thing that I just heard him say that just really resonated. Those that listen well will be listened to, Rabbi Simon Jacobson. And I think that it's like, I'm learning how to not run my, my mouth so motherfucking much. <laughs> and the good thing about gray hair is sometimes when somebody says some goofy shit, just like how you're, we could just say, hmm. <laughs> interesting. It's interesting. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? We've, we've just been lucky enough, blessed enough, fortunate enough to walk upright on earth for the amount of time that we've been here. So we're supposed to be great. Yes. We're supposed to be excellent. It's not luck. It's not luck that, that, that this happens to us. It's like, well, how can I be? Well, you know what? Keep living. Keep living. Keep breathing. Get your heart broken. You know, go through some shit that you don't think that you can handle. And you know what? And your grapes will put out some great Primitivo wine that comes out of you. Wow. So the pilot told me one time on the plane, mm. he says, uh, you know, 90% of the trip is course correction. He says, we're not flying in a straight line. No. He says, man, I got to keep this, keep putting this thing on track. He says, most of the time we're off course. He says, also, when you're driving your car, 90% of your trip is course correction. And I said, well, my life, 90% of the time is course correction. Wow. You're off. But you got 10% of the time where you are focused on your outcome. You're from it. You're from the place you're going. If you could think from the place you're going instead of thinking of it, be there now. D d do you see what I'm saying? Bruh. If you're there now. Your body says, yes, we're there now. Yeah. Your brain and all this stuff is like, it's simple machines. And it's like, if you say we're there, you're the captain. Yeah. You're the composer. You're yeah. the conductor. In fact, yeah. you're the super conductor. Yeah. 
Be there now. Yeah, be. And that's my whole thing. Be. Yeah. Dr. B is about being. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And they say that the bumblebee cannot fly. Wow. It's too heavy. Its little wings can't support. And scientists say it's, it's impossible. Well, I, I guess it didn't get the email. It wasn't on their IG. They didn't get the chat. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> With the text message. Because it's flying. It's levitating because it is. It's being. And when you're being, you can only be right now. You can't be if you're in the past, right? You're passe. You're passive. You're passed out trying to pull the past into now. And if we could f focus on the events from the past that possibly could help us, yeah, that could be helpful. But what happens is, is a lot of times we're focusing on the disagreeable past, all the bad things, and you can't fix it. No. You can't fix it. And the future is a mystery. But if you're living in right now, which I call to now, and you make this moment, you maximize this moment, you live it, you feel it, you know it right now. If it, you know, it's like you told me, you said, look, man, if you just take your hands and put them on the piano, play a chord, play one chord. It's going to be right. Just play one chord. Yeah. Just hold that one chord. And then you, you had told me, you said, move it up a half step. Yeah. 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 Play the same chord and it's then move it up half step. Yeah. I told you, I said, get your, get your three or four chords. I said, even if you got to write it down, I said, each half step that you go up, it's going to spawn something in you. It's a hack. And all you're doing is playing who you are. Yeah. And it's interesting. I was asking the question because I wanted to start playing the different keys. Yeah. See, on the keyboard, I only play, I mean, I might have eight chords. Okay. I know. I've cut so many songs, made so many records. Got because it's infinite. It's just, I'm playing the same thing backwards, forwards, over here, over here, and over here. Then I'll call in somebody like you and say, well, you see what I'm doing? And you'll say, oh, well, let's do this. Let's put the major over the minor. Let's take the this. Yeah. Let's move that. And yeah. then you'll play. And I'm like, you know, bringing that forward and letting and handing it off. Yeah. And being a great musician is, is also knowing how to fit into the field. Knowing where your signature can be used and you're not taking over the space. It's knowing how to ask the right questions, too. Mm. And sometimes asking the right questions is like me and you talking. And the, the right questions might be us going down to get coffee right now. <laughs> because we're making music right now. Yes. So it's knowing the right questions to ask. And it's like saying, okay, let me just listen to this. And then there's times when you can trust that. With how technology is now, I can be like, okay, B, just hit record. Because I know that Nirvana is going to happen. Like, people are like, Mel, do that again. It's like, well, you know what? You should have, it's your job to catch the magic when, when it happens. That's right. But all that to be said, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's knowing how to be respectful and being of service to what the art piece that you're writing. It's like, hmm. I could be like, okay, you tell me what it is that you want. Okay, I want this. Okay, cool. I'll play that. And then if I do my job well enough, I might just say, hey, man, give me a couple tracks and let me just let me just do what the music is telling me. Yeah. And it seems like 90 to 95% of the times when I say that, some part of that winds up staying on people's records. Yeah. Because if we're doing something right, it's supposed to be bigger than what we could imagine. And sometimes bigger is just a millisecond off and a microtone off, a little bit sharp or flat, but that is a world of difference. Yes. Yes. What do we talk about? 360 degrees point one. Yes. That is a infinite world of difference. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So now we're moving out of a circle into a spiral. And a spiral is going to keep expanding. And that's spirituality. Everything is changing. Yeah. It's not staying the same. When you're truly spiritual, you're growing and expanding. Like where the earth is right now, it's never been before. Right. We're spiraling through space. The, the moon is spiraling around the earth. The sun is spiraling around Sirius. Yeah. We're all spiritual. Our, our, our blood, our circulatory system is all spirals. 
you can your blood your your your, your 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 if you took all of your capillaries and veins and tied them all together, they'd go around the world. I think it's four times. Really? How does your heart pump that? How does your your heart is that quick? I think it's what a minute, less than a minute or so. When your that blood leaves the heart and goes all the way around the world and comes back, that's crazy. Technically, that's impossible. Just like it's impossible for the bumblebee to 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 do what it does. It's impossible for a lot of things because they haven't been proven. They haven't been figured out because there's a whole other world. That's that dimension that your father was talking about. This next door where everything is different. But you tap into that when you're ready. There are things that happen to us that happen to tap us in. And you have to be ready to capture that moment and live that moment and let yeah. that moment be instead of trying to control everything. So music is able to, you know, take us from wherever we are. You know, you could be in a terrible mood and turn yeah. on a certain, certain yeah. music. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And wow, it yeah. just changes everything. Yeah. So you... I, you know, you and I talked a little earlier, and I can look at you and I see a different glow. Really? It's a different energy around you. Really? Because okay. a lot of times when I see you, you know, you, you when you're on the keyboard, yeah. it's amazing. Right. But when you get off the keyboard, it's like you're kind of like, I don't know, I says, is, he, is, he, is he happy? Is he searching? Where is he? What's going on? I'm like, and I've always had a love for you. Right. You know, and he's on the keyboard. That's one thing about being a, a professional. You take all your problems and put them aside and you do your very best. Or you use the pain or the joy or the happiness or the orgasm or whatever you're in I get it. and put it into the music. But as I see you now, mm. I'm saying I'm, I'm talking to a different Kenneth Crouch. What's happening with you, man? Man, I'm waking up. Rip Van Winkle is like, he's on a snooze right now. So I'm investigating and I'm questioning things and I'm engaging in things that I thought that I would never engage in. Hmm. I'm doing stuff that my mother told me not to do. Hmm. And I'm cautious and I have my wits about me and I'm trusting the process and it's funny, you say like searching, it's like, I, I'm, I'll play you another time. It's like, I, I have this tune that I wrote and it was called, What Am I Searching For? And so what I realize is that sometimes when we're like going around in circles, like we're like chasing ourselves. It's like, we're enough. And to get to a point where, if you remember the Matrix, at the very beginning of the Matrix, Neo said, I know karate when they were when they you know he took the pill and then they, they started downloading the information. And then Morpheus was like basically like you're trying too hard. And then like when the Mr. Smiths would come and, and he was like get his ass kicked. But if you notice at the end of the movie, Neil was almost like in a theta state. And all the Mr. Smiths with all of their might and everything they were trying to come from. And he was just like swatting. His hands were almost like, it was almost like a hummingbird. Yes. Like uh, like if Bruce Lee was a hummingbird. Yes. Like moving like that. And I feel that now, and I'm still getting over my me, but when I play, I'm just playing my heart. I'm just playing my heart. And I'm realizing that that's what I'm supposed to do. And my heart is okay. And the right people will hear it. <laughs> it's not my responsibility to try to convince somebody. It took me a long time to, to get that. And I still have to, and I still have to convince myself of that sometimes. But like now when I play, it's like I know it's gonna be okay. And I have a saying I tell myself, I say, I know I'm going to be all right, even though I don't know what all right is. And so just knowing that it's okay. You know, it's we're forever, you know, chopping the wood that's in front of us. And it never stops. But, you know, I do my best to try to strike for nirvana. And when that comes, it's great. And then you just keep on going. You know, and another thing <laughs> I realize that one day and someday is today. Wow. Wow. 
So I'm going to say a few words and you just tell me what comes up. Okay. Infinity. Huh. <laughs> us beyond us. So what does that mean? Us beyond us. Give me a little more. So you said earlier, you said that you have eight chords or so. You like, I only have eight chords and I write that stuff off of that. Do you know that if you never if you never learned any more chords, or if you never wrote a song, another song, and you said that you were just going to use that. If you stop creating right now, but you just use like your dats and like all the stuff that you've written like over the past 40, 50 years or whatever, what you've written now, even your incomplete swatches are millenniums of infinite music that you've written. You're walking infinity. So even when you tapped out, you're tapping out at fucking infinity, man. We're everlasting. That's why I came, it came to me, Kinfinite. Like, once I'm gone from here, it still goes on. You know, like when we listen to the music of like, like Stravinsky or Scriabin or Art Tatum, Miles, are they dead? Maybe their body is. But when you put that record on, you hear something new. So that lets me know that even though their shell may not be here, they have to be everlasting. We're, we're everlasting. And I really understand that. It's like, even if I think I'm tapping out, it's I'm tapping out at, a, at, at infinity. It's interesting you say that because those records that you mentioned, those artists, every time you play... Every time I play one of those records, mm. I hear something I never heard before. Yeah. And I've heard these records hundreds of times. What is that? So they're still playing. <sighs> Come on, man. Even Quincy Jones. I listen to Quincy Jones stuff. I'm like, is, what is that way over in the background? Is that a cowbell or something? Yeah. What is that weird sound over there? You know, you start listening at a deeper level because we're not the same people. Right. We're, 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 you know, when we say I, yeah. we're talking about us in the past. Yeah. That's actually an impossibility. That can't be you because all of your cells, right? All of your bones and everything are new in seven years. Wow. You get a new heart every so many months. You get new lungs. The lungs and the digestive tract renew themselves really quickly. Your skin, you get new skin every month. So we're constantly regenerating then. You're regenerating because you got these stem cells that are waiting for something to die off so something new can grow. If you don't let go of something that's old, nothing new can grow. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? Copy. So a lot of things we're holding on to so nothing new can grow. That's where courage comes in. So the courage is huge. Like you say, a lot of people will say their mantra. And their mantra will be, I'm no longer afraid of blah, blah, blah. And I say, you're mentioning the problem in the prayer. So you are going to get more of that because the energetic field, the dynamics of that. Is what you're is what you're telling the universe. It's almost canceling it out. It's canceling it. Instead of saying, I am courageous. I am love. Instead of saying, I want to be married one day. Right. I am married. You gotta be evenly yoked with yourself. Man. It ain't this piece of paper and this ring and this talk. Come on now. You gotta be married to your instrument, married to your art, married to yourself. And sometimes you gotta feel, you gotta look at yourself and say, These are the parts of myself that I don't like. Yeah. Would you date yourself? Right. Would you hire yourself for the session? Right. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So when you start looking at life and breaking it down like that, now you're tapping into the infinite mind that we all have because we can tap into the infinite mind. And there's times it happens. Yeah. There's times when those other dimensions do come together. Sure. Scientists are now saying there's at least 11 dimensions that they have said. We've always said there's at least 144 dimensions, mm. which means there's 144 Kenneth Crouches mm. doing a slightly different things mm. in different places. One of them, you know, you're, you only play accordion. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
He's the baddest accordion player in town. Hilarious. <laughs> you see, but we're slightly different in these other dimensions. So it's not just this place. It's who we are right now. And, you know, we have to get into the art of displacement, too. Okay, so explain, break that down. So displacement is when, let's say you're making a submarine. Copy. Displacement is you have to have a certain barrier between the outside and the inside. We got to keep the oxygen oxygen in. Yeah. We got to keep the, the water, water out. Beautiful song by John Mayer. Mm. Oh, my gosh. Walt Grace. Okay. Submarine song. Wow. Every time I play this song, I cry. Wow. In fact, we just did this thing called the God Power event. Oh. And it was one of the biggest events ever online. Yeah. And at the end, I say, I'm going to play this song because this is my life. Yeah, man. This guy is making a submarine in his basement. His wife says he's crazy and tells the children daddy's lost his mind. He takes the fan blade from the family fan to be. Yeah, the propeller. The propeller. He's taking parts from junkyards. He's building a submarine in the basement. His friends at the bar Almost say like an he's arc. crazy. Like the Ark. Yes. His friends at the, at the bar say he's crazy. They're talking about everybody says he's nuts. He finds that when he's down there working on a submarine, he's in his own space. Absolutely. And in the song, he says he's working, a, he working away at displacement because he's looking to be in a beautiful, quiet place. And in the song, it says he finally finishes it. And he rolls the, the submarine from, from wet sand, from dry land into wet sand. And he puts it in the water and he looks out at the sky. And he says the weather, was, the sea was as rough as he's ever seen it. This is very important. The sea was as rough as he's ever seen it. And he sees the sun and he sees the sun going down and he closes the hatch. And for the first time, the world is silent. He only hears himself. And he goes under the water. The wife is waiting for the phone call. It's going to be bad news. You know, nobody can make a submarine. The whole town is waiting. Right. He's going to die. Yeah. Months later, the call gets that she knows is coming. But it's him on the other line. Huh. He's in Japan. Huh. It's a collect call from Japan. He made the submarine. And I think the song is based on real life. John Mayer is called the, man, this is the, I'm going to look it up. This is the most, um, and the music is crazy. And this was when John Mayer, they said he was going through something because they said he was going to get his vocal cords mm, operated on. He may not yeah. be able to sing anymore. So he made this really deep album. But that song, every time I hear it, it brings me to tears because it reminds me of myself. I get it. Growing up, working on displacement, you know, going through all the stuff in the world and, you know, be looking for my own space, creating. And the drums would take me into a trance state. Yeah. I can sit there and play for hours and hours and just black out the world. Yeah. So displacement is when you're in your place. Right. And you're creating a sacred space. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Mm. So now, next word for you. Okay. A sacred space. What does that mean for you? <sighs> sacred space. Holy, honest, and pure. Hmm. And respectful. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Love. <sighs> Nicholas and Sophia. Uh, I was telling myself, I, whew, I remember when I was breaking up with my wife, I told her, I said, Thank you for giving me the two best songs I can never write. And I look at them and I'm just like, they're so much better than me. And I get so much pride when I see that, when I see them. And I see their magic in real time. And I'm like, man, I can never be as good as them because they're so magical. Wow. That's what love is. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah, man. 
What's peace for you? When do you find peace? <sighs> I've always had this mental image of like when we would watch like cowboy and like Western movies and when the bad guy would come into town and he would scare the people off and you see the Acme store on one side and you see the saloon on the other. And he might be in the middle of a duel and you see a man walk in the middle of the street and there's tumbleweeds and stuff going and there's wind and stuff, but he's calming himself down and he puts his arms out. And in the midst of the confusion, it's almost like when James Cleveland said, peace be still. It's knowing that it's not going to be tumultuous forever. Trusting that you got to stand there, but it's going to pass. And peace isn't always peaceful. But when you look back on it, you realize it's there. Yes. Yeah. Is there anything from your past that you would do differently? <clears throat> I would say believe in myself more. But then I'm like, maybe this is what it was supposed to be at this point in time right now. This, this is how I know I can answer that. I encourage my kids in a way that I didn't get encouragement and in a way that I didn't encourage myself. Wow. It's hardly a conversation that goes by when I'm going to tell my kids that I love them and that I'm proud of them. I think it's so important to let our kids know that we're proud of them. Even if they're just clean up the room or getting stranded on the freeway or whatever, you're putting one foot in front of the other. And when I just see how intelligent they are, I'm like, I feel like I'm cheating. Cause I'm like, they're so good. Encouraging your kids. That's the magic. Wow. Yeah. Out of songs that you've written. Yeah. What would you say was you, to you, which would be your best song? <sighs> I'm always chasing. I don't know if I have sat down with myself long enough to even contemplate that. Wow. Cause even if I'm even when I'm just uh working on something or like might even like mixing a song or putting something together, there's always something that's I I I squirrel. And I'm like, okay, let me just get this, like, okay, I just got to just get this quick little idea down. And it could just be just like a little clustery sort of thing. But there's like little pieces of truths that I just have to put down. So I don't know if I've written, I don't, I don't know what that song is. I, I know what those Sophia and Nicholas are. Wow. They're the perfection. But as far as like, stuff that I've written. I I have uh, moments where I'm like, okay, ooh, I like the way that this feels. I like the way that these these strings and these French horns sound. I'm like, ooh. And it's crazy, like during COVID, I wrote an opera, I wrote a bunch of stuff, and for some reason, it's like all that music got, I don't know where that music is. 
And then I thought, well, man, maybe it's um, arrogant for me to think that. But I just said, well, if I could write something once, I can write something again. Wow. And I know that there is still a lot of stuff that I'm just digging through the rubble to plant more stuff. So as an artist, as a composer, how do you deal with the influx of information that's coming to you from the cosmos? How do you organize it? How do you, you know, select what you're going to do? I vomit it up as quick as I can. Mm. I put all the marbles and everything on the table. I just put everything in the kitchen sink on there. And then it's almost like subtractive EQ. I'm just like, okay, I like all of this, but let me just, let me just cherry pick what I think the most important or the most impactful pieces of the mosaic in there. So throwing everything against the thing and doing my best not, not to judge it from, uh, oh, my God, you're shitty or this is that. But knowing that I have to have all of these things in order to get that. Yeah. That's the way that I kind of manage it. Because it's like I... I've been learning something like the other day. I'm like, you know what? We we look for inspiration, but I, but I realize waiting for inspiration is a real arrogant way of looking at the art. Mm. It's like I'll do it when I'm ready, and I'm like, you know what? And it hit, it hit me the other day. It's like, how dare you? I don't want to be who is it? Was it Van Gogh or what? When he cut off his ear. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be that. And I'm like, wow, that's a really arrogant way of looking at the gift. Well, God, I just don't feel it. And you know what? It's some, Mike Tyson said, when you know something is good for you, do something that you hate as though you love it, and then you get better at it. Wow. And trust me, I'm talking to myself when I say this because I don't have it lit. But I do know that I'm like, man, I need to respect this more. And you know what? And all that to say, when you're an artist, and that sounds kind of cliche, it's like we're constantly at odds with ourselves. Hmm. Constantly. You're questioning, is it good? Is it not good? Is it this or that? But then there's something to be said about I'm just going to put something together. I'm going to put myself on a deadline and I'm going to share my book report in front of the class. And to know that however good that thing is right now, it's just a snapshot in time. And it's just giving people the opportunity to see who you were at that time. And then you can go on to the next. Wow. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. That's the way I know how to answer that. Do you feel that creativity comes from you or through you? Absolutely through me. Especially when I play. Like when you see me play and I close, people's like, hey, what are you looking at? I'm like, when, I, when, you, see me, when I, you see me do my head, I literally feel it coming down. So I'll, I'll tell you a story. I remember one time I was playing with Clapton. And we were on stage, and I'm playing, and I look at my hands, and I look over, and I see him, and I look at the audience. Oh, I look down at my hands, and I look at the audience, and I look over to him. And I'm like, man, this is just a big high school pep rally. <laughs> <laughs> we're just playing for the kids during lunchtime. But I notice that the more... I said, thank you, like I was middle, middle playing. It was crazy, like bikers would come up to me because like he's like in the program too. So like people like from NA and AA, they would come up to me, they say, I don't know what it is, but when you play, you make me feel like 
I'm in church and I haven't been in church in 30 years. I'm just being me. That's it. And I can remember playing and I was just like saying, Lord, thank you in the middle of playing. And the more I said, thank you, I felt like he was just pushing it down more on me. I'm like, Lord, you got to stop. I can't take it. I can't. Please stop. And the more I was just like, just basking in the, in the embryo of sonic wonderment. I felt like it was choking me. I'm like, God, please stop. Because it's so honest. It is the truth. Whether they, whoever they is, I know it's the truth. And it was like coming down on me like liquid bricks. And then it just like comes out. Like I have this analogy where... You know what the aorta looks like. Mm -hmm. But imagine the, the aorta comes out and then fingers come out of the aorta. Mm. That's always been my mental. It's like I'm literally playing my physical heart and the valves turn into fingers and they hit the keys. It's interesting with the heart, the nerves come from the heart and go down the arms. Really? So the word art means arms and heart. You got to stop, man. <laughs> you are arms and me. heart. Man. You see? So our arms are expressing our heart. It, it, do you know what I'm saying? And art, <sighs> which is heart, is also earth. You take heart, change a few letters, you get yeah. earth. That's your center. Yeah. You, you see what I'm saying? I, I look at nature and I see every tree and every plant expressing themselves totally different all the time. They're never the same. They're never doing the same thing. Yeah. Never. No, no two flowers look the same. No they two don't. snowflakes. No. You know, nature is always different. So what I really loved about improvisational music was it was always different. Yeah. Every gig we did was different. We yeah. didn't know what was going to happen. Right. You know, I, 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 when I was doing Top 40, I didn't like it. Right. I said, why don't they just play the record? Right. Why do I have to play the same exact rhythm, make the song sound just like they're here? But they're not. Right. They used to play with my head. I right. Like, no, let's do something totally creative. Right. But that creativity is beautiful when you are able to, you know, put your emotion into it. Yeah. And, you know, um, emotion is something today that you see people are stifling. Yeah. You, you're, you're to be fake. Yeah. Just do it. Just as what you got to do to make to get the people, give the people what they want. But emotion, which is to me energy in motion, which tends to stay in motion yeah. until acted upon by an equal or opposite force. Yeah. By taking all the emotion and all the experiences of Kenneth Crouch is what creates what you play and who you are. And maybe it's not giving people what they want. Maybe it's giving people what they need. What they need, which is the medicine. And realizing that we're channels. Yeah. We're channeling. Absolutely. We're mediums. We, it is not I, my stuff. It's we. Right. Our stuff. I remember I was, you know, working with some herbs at one time. And yeah. I kept talking about me and what I'm doing. And this voice in case says, not you. It's we. Right. We. You're a universe. I mean, how many different types of friendly bacteria do you have in your gut? Right. How many, you know, there's so many beings within us. And you got your parents. You got their parents and their parents, and they're all channeling through you. You're at the top of the pyramid. It's not you. It's not you. You're a walking ecosystem. It's we. Yeah. It's we. We. <sighs> Which is like, yes, we. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, at this particular time, am opening up more to the we. Yeah. The we. Yeah. And when, you know, uh, the, you know, my people were saying, you know, Dr. B, you should do this medicine. You should do this thing on music. I was like, I don't know. They should, yeah, you do. They know you in metaphysics. They know you in natural health. Do something on music because you never get that deep into music. Right. And I'm really thankful now because I was able to go back and say, well, who are my people? Who are my we? Who are the Truth. people who I would call Man. to talk to who may not ever do anything like this and be interviewed this way? 
And it, it's interesting the people who have come forward so far and said, yes, I'm down. Yeah. You, you know, you're at the last moment. Yeah. This is like hours ago. Yeah. It, you know, you're a world traveler. You know what I'm saying? You're like, yes. And then you happen to be right up the street. But here's one thing I've learned. No matter where you go, you can be right down the street. We can be in Inglewood or we can be in India. No matter where you go, well, no matter where you go, your tribe is always there. Yes. And what this place we're at now is called tribe. <laughs> and the symbol, the symbol of this place is not on the cup, but it's a bee. Yeah. Which has always been my thing. The bee. I'm being. Man. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So, yeah. okay, my last name began with a B, and I used to call my, my father brother, you know, brother B. My uncle, my favorite uncle was uh, Uncle B. Right. My favorite aunt on the other side was Aunt B. See. And when I was young, I got stung by hundreds of bees. Wow. And in order to get them to stop stinging me, I had to just stop and breathe. It's the only way they would stop. But they gave me this information, and I have this connection now. Bees, I can go outside, and they just land on me. It's like because I'm in this calm state, I'm connected to the bee. And when we become human being, wow. that means we're being in this moment. You can only be here right now. Yeah. Musically, you can only play the instrument right now. Right. You can't play it tomorrow. No. You can't, you can't replay what you've already played. When you're in the state of being and you're in the orchestra of life in this moment. Come on, man. Your voice is your instrument. Yep. Your movements, your actions, your deeds, all these things are your music. Yeah. And you're creating a paradigm. You're creating a vortex. You're creating a whole environment. And now we know that the genes are not doing what you think they're doing. The genes are expressing the environment. Huh. They have now proved that the genes are waiting to express the environment. So your food is your environment. Yeah. So you say, well, you know, the, the cancer runs in your family. Well, what do they all eat? And how do they all act? They find that one child, right, who was orphaned off as, as you know, as, as a baby, didn't get cancer. This whole family, everybody in the family wears glasses. One child was orphaned off. It doesn't wear glasses. So if it was in the genes, that, that means that everybody would have the same thing. But the, the genes atmosphere. are like pants. You got to put them on. So the environment is what creates the genes. And now we know that the music affects the genes. Yep. Look at how people act listening to certain music. Facts. So we are in the gene pool. And the genes are the genies. The rug, the carpet that the genie is on yeah. is DNA on its side. Huh. The genie is sitting there, right? Huh. When you rub the genie bottle, the huh. genie pops out. Yeah. The, body, the bottle is the body. When you vibrate, when you say things, when you do things, the genie pops out, the cork pops off the top of the genie bottle. A vapor comes out. And that vapor becomes the genie and asks you, what do you desire? What are your wishes? And you speak and you say what your desires are and your genes, which are your genies, give you what you desire. Wow. So if you say uh, you, all the disagreeable things, it says, well, that must be what you want. Right. But if you start thinking about what you truly desire, right. I truly desire to be on stage and show up. I truly desire to do this art piece. I truly desire to ex exist in love and yeah. peace and find harmony and do good things and be you know, a beautiful person, have friends in all walks of life. Yeah. If you start focusing on that, your genes rearrange themselves and say, hey, he's the captain. She's the captain. They are the captain. What would you like? So we have to get into what we would like. So right. listening to certain music, yeah. right? You may say, well, it's not affecting you. It is. We can scientifically yeah. prove that the music you're listening to is affecting you. If you're listening to a bunch of loopy music and it's the same thing over and over and over and people yelling at you saying some things, you're, you're being programmed. Absolutely. If you listen to something different, because I used to always say, listen to what you like, but go listen to something real. Every once in a while, go listen to some real music, go to a real concert, listen to some jazz, listen to some country. Country, they got stories. Yes, man. They got some stories. Yes, sir. Rees. Absolutely. And you know what I'm saying? And yeah. they're real, they're open, they're authentic. You know, if you're R&B, you can't do that. Well, maybe you should go back to soul because soul music was about coming from your soul. Absolutely. What I love about you is you're a soul musician huh. because you come from an emotional place. I do. 
And that soul, which is the light, because soul is sun. Right. Right. The sun is shining on you, giving you information in your solar plexus, and it's coming out in your heart. Huh. I feel it every time your name comes up. Huh. Every time it's mentioned. I remember when I was working on the Indy I Read track, and we called George Duke in. And you had played the acoustic piano, and George Duke says, Who, Who's that playing the piano? <laughs> I said, That's Kenneth Crouch. He says, That's Kenneth? I said, Yeah. He says, Wow. I said, but here's the Moog synthesizer. He says, no, 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 no. I got an answer. Kenneth, get, I need a Rhodes. So he pulls up the Rhodes patch and everything, and he starts playing. He goes into this thing, and it was like you and him were there. This was months later after but you played your part. great, though? And it was crazy the way you guys were. It was like you were in the room. I have to let you hear that track, man. That was just, just, but it was, it's something that you said earlier. Even though we weren't there because of a little thing called time, but we were there. But the time doesn't exist. Right. It's just your, what, your perception of it, what you right. think it is. And it's two master craftsmen having a conversation with one another. He said he had to answer you. i never forget his words. And I'm going to tell you one other thing that was really interesting. Huh. He plays the roads. Uh. And this is like, oh, my God. Yeah. This is crazy. Yeah, yeah. And he said, okay, let's play. And he plays this solo. Crazy yeah. solo on the move, right? And I said, oh, wow. He says, okay, B. He says, cool. And I said, well, you know, Mr. 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 Uh, Mr. Duke, you know, I just wanted to let you know that I grew up listening to your music. Because this was the time we ever, first time we ever worked together. Yeah, yeah. I used to always see him at the NAM and everything. Sure. I love this music. I grew up, you know, listening to it and honoring him. And I said, Mr. Duke, you know, when I was young, I said, if I ever work with you, ever, that means I've made it. So today, I think I've made it. He said, oh, wow, good, good, good. And Corrine was with him. You know, and Corrine wow. used to come to all of our gigs. Corrine used to sit up front and watch she me play sure Congress. She sure did. Corrine, his wife, would always she sit sure there and did. watch me. She said, Dr. B, I love the way you play the Congress. Right? So she's there, right? And this blew my mind. I said, well, Mr. Duke, could you do one more thing? He says, well, what else you need? Be anything. I says, could you play uh, Harmony Against the Solo that you played? He says, what do you mean? I says, can you do a harmony to that solo? He says, you want me to play harmony to that? The solo's crazy. I get it. He says to me, he says, how am I going to do that? I said, well, you're George Duke. He says, I never played that before in my life. I don't I even know. It. And he, I said, please, well, you know, if we got to pay extra, what we got to do? And Corrine starts smiling. And she sits down. And he says, okay. Did he go bit by bit? Man, it was crazy. He pulled out paper. He's listening to this play it back. We have to play this thing back. And he's writing these funny, they're not even notes. They're I not even it. notes. I get it. And he's like, I he keeps it. looking at me. He's like, man, he's sweating at one point. And he's, and he's, try, and he's working and working and working and working. And finally, we had to do it bit by bit. Yeah, man. And he, he did like, you know, one part was like fifths. Another part was like thirds or something. Yeah, man. And man, it was crazy. And, he, and at the end, he was done. And he said, B, he says, man. I don't know where you came from, man. I don't, he says, I don't know. He says, but you know, I haven't been challenged in 25 years. You're the first person to challenge George Duke in 25 years. He said, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And he bowed and walked out the room. I was like, I was there. I was in tears. Oh my God. I challenged George Duke. Because the music told you to do that. And he was honoring the music. He was honoring. And to be honorable is the main thing. Once we begin to honor life, once we begin to honor who we are yeah. and be honorable and be open and be honest and tell the truth. Yeah. If you don't like something, say you don't like it. Because a lot of times we're saying yes and, we, you know, because the person is important. Yeah. You got to be able to speak, you know, truth to power sometimes. Of course. No, I don't need to do that. There's a yeah. lot of times I'll turn down a session. Sure. Say, no, that's not for me. Like yeah. a lot of times with a lot of the hip hop today, people call me and say, well, can you? No, I don't, I don't do that. I'm only doing music now, which has to do with taking our consciousness to another level. Copy. That's the only thing I'm doing. I don't, it's not about the money anymore. I get it. I'm set with, with finances. So with each of us right now, we get a chance to show up with our signature, a sign of our nature. Come on, man. A signature is a sign of your nature. What What is your signature? Who are you? Or have you lost your ID? Or has your ID been stolen? Man. What, you, have your ideals been stolen? You know what I'm saying? And you caught up in the morals and the more rules. Sometimes you got to break the rules. Like you said, you went against everything your mother was saying was right. But mm. you had to go to that place, yeah. which is the deep darkness. Yeah. Because the dark is where everything is born. So if you could say something right now to your mom, 
What would you say? Oh my God. Thank you for being who you are. So that I am who I am. Wow. You're dead. <sighs> Thank you for teaching me how to hear the voices. My dad is magic. If you look in the dictionary or the encyclopedia and you look at what the definition of a man is, next to Jesus is my father. Wow. I hope that I'm making him proud. And I hope one day I can be the man that he was. Wow. Wow. Folks out there, you have been traveling in, with the serious vibes with this powerful brother and uh, his whole world, his vortex that he carries. Have you he, been to Sedona? Yes, I have. I went through the vortex. There's a there's a, a record that I did, and I want you to hear it. And I went through the vortex in Sedona, and <sighs> it's amazing. You are a vortex. Oh. Every time I talk to you, every time I'm near you, it, you are a vortex. So there, there's places on the earth where there's energy, right? But there are people on the earth with energy. I just want to say to the world right now that I respect you. I love you. I feel you. You know, your family, your children, everything that you came through, the alchemy that you went to to get here to this particular point. You know, I respect that, and I love that. And I'd like you to tell the people, where can they find your music? What do you have out there? What are you working on? Where can they link up with the real Kenneth Crouch? Um, you can look me up. I'm on all the uh, digital platforms. I'm on you know, Spotify, Tidal, uh, Apple Music, uh, Pandora, all that stuff. And then you can follow me on Instagram. Just look up Kenneth Crouch, and you'll see me. I'm there. And I have a bunch of, uh, I have this thing where I was, when I go out and play, I sample pianos everywhere I go. With the noise in the background, I sample it right off of my phone. I'm like, Dr. B's piano, uh, Macon, Georgia, Steinway, Upright, a zero and I play all the notes and it might be kids playing outside and everything it does not matter because what people are getting to hear is a snapshot in time of the truth that I got to play on that piano right then wow. and I write these I do these 90 second improvisational compositions that I don't think about I'm just like okay so if I had a piano here I could just be okay Tribal tuning, this is the name of the song, and then the song comes out. And it's just what it is. And it's just honest splashes. It's like Leroy Neiman throwing paint against the wall. Wow. That's what it is. Honest splashes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Last words for the people out there. What message would you have for people, whether they're musicians or just people living life? You're enough, tap into your magic, listen to you, and shape shift between the quadrants. See, now we can't tap into that right now because we'd have to be You asked me to say something. I'm just telling you just what it comes to me, so... Tap in between the quadrants. You got to give me just a little bit more than that, please, sir. Tap in between the quadrants. Yeah. You have to dance on the stars, man. You got to, like, the quasars, the stars, the nebulas. Those are all. This is how I can 
this is how I can honestly say that. Outer space is an inside job. So outer space is inner space. It's an inside job, yes. As above, so below. Come on, man. Moat, yes. Yes, sir. And the darkness is where all the light is, man. So you're telling people to go into the darkness? You gotta, you gotta go into the dark because that's the deeper you go, the deeper those roots go. <sighs> and once those roots come up and they hit daylight, that's great. But the real story is us digging down into the into the dark, and that's where the light is. Knowing, and that's where where it says like faith without works is dead. To know that. Even though you might see it, you see it because you feel it. And the dark is a good place. The dark is necessary. Wow. One last thing. The difference in tuning concert pitch, tuning your piano to concert pitch 440 and 432. Oh, man. <laughs> 440. Pumpkin pie, 432 sweet potato pie. Whew. <laughs> wow. Sorry for all you pumpkin pie enthusiasts, but. Or you could say pumpkin pie, what, 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 sweet potato pie could be bean pie too. Mm. It's soulful. Soulful. It's super soulful. Wow. Wow. That's beautiful. Thank right you. On, thank man. you. Thank you. Thank you, man. Man, it's been beautiful to have you man, here, man. Thank you. This has been an absolute pleasant surprise. Uh, you know what? I have a saying I say, thank God he is, and I'm not. Wow. Wow. And um, I'm thinking about putting together a, a book of quotes, too. Just, I've been writing stuff down for like 30 years and didn't realize I've been doing it. So these little utterances. Just figuring out how I want to like piece them together with, with my musical swatches. So, and I have a working title of that, but that'll be for me and you to talk about. Yeah. Well, this has been a an amazing ride, a surprise. It's been an honor. Oh man, to, pleasure to all convene mine. with you. And this is the just the beginning. Absolutely. You know, and and I tell folks, I said the best way to pray is to be grateful in advance. Man. And act as if you are already there. I'm grateful for the new car. I'm grateful for the new music. Yes. The, the new vibe, the new piano. You know what I'm saying? Things yes. show up in, in, in funny type of ways. Isn't that crazy? But you have to be grateful for it now instead of praying and begging for God to give it to you. And, you know, call God for the heavy stuff, I say. Call call the cosmos for the heavy stuff. Yeah. That's That's, you know, the heavy stuff is not that. You can no. make that happen. You just move towards it. Right. You know, just go to the piano store and keep playing and yeah. imagine it's yours. Yeah. And some, somebody may give it away. You, you know what I'm saying? You yeah. never know. So yeah. being grateful in advance. And I was grateful in advance for this particular day. Man. In this particular time, this particular show, you know, the serious vibes as we tap into the vibrations of the universe, the Absolutely. omniverse, and we are all musicians. We're all singing a song and it's about you expressing yourself, going deep in, getting away from the mainstream, doing something way out on the limb. Go way out. Herbie Hancock told me when I was was. When I was 21 years old, when I was working with my brother, who was Herbie's engineer, and I wow. said, Mr. Hancock, I says, what would you say, you know, about, you know, for, to be a producer, wh wh what would you do? And he says, go out on the limb. Do yeah. not follow the crowd. I never forgot this. Go out on the limb. Don't do anything anybody else is doing. Be totally creative. Be out there alone. It's really and never be afraid that the limb is going to break. Wow. And if it does... Record that. Now, he didn't say that. I put that on the The limb does break. Record that. Record it. You know what? It's really funny because I put some music out, and then uh, Robert Glasper hit me up, and he's like, bruh. He goes, this record. He goes, man, he goes, people don't have the kind of courage to do what the record that you did. I'm like, really? Because I'm just, honestly, I'm just looking at it like, 
I just needed to just, I just, oh, I just got to just get this out of my system. And not to be like, you know, oh my God, Robert, but it's like, but when you have somebody, when your contemporaries appreciate what you do, it's like, that's a good thing, you know? And I remember, I remember saying to Herbie years ago, I said, man, Herbie, I feel like I, I hear everything and nothing. He just laughed and goes, yeah, man, I know what you mean. So we're not alone. We're, we're as alone as you think that you are. There's a bunch of hippies who think the same way as you do, too. Yeah. Your tribe is everywhere. Yes. You don't exactly. let a little thing like language or a lot of they're Serbian and I'm English. And it's like, OK, well, grunts get a long way, too. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And I find that, you know, we, we get out of this validation thing, mm. trying to get everybody to validate us. Mm. You know, that courage gets you out of validation. Yeah. And, you know, once you look into everybody else to validate what you're doing, you yeah. become an invalid. Whew. You're invalid. You're in a wheelchair. Come on, man. You know what I'm saying? You, you're, you're stuck more than somebody that is actually having what you might call a handicap. Come on, because man. Because you need other people to pump you up. Yeah. When you say, this is who I am, yeah. this is my signature. Right. I am who I am, and be courageous. Right. Thank you for being courageous. Thank you, brother. Thank you for everything you've brought to the planet. I love you. I love man, you. I love, love you, back, man. man. Thank you so we much. We got to do this again. Absolutely. Travel light. Absolutely. Get rid of that luggage. It's not yours anyway. Copy. Thank you very much. My man. Thank you very okay. much, you. This has been another uh, serious vibe show, and there's going to be many more coming. We have great things coming up, but be yourself. Be now. Be, be loving. Be free. Be wise. Be open. Be creative. Travel light. See you again soon. I'm going to let you, um, I'm going to shoot you some stuff that I'm, that I'm doing, too. It's, um, I think you would take you it. You sent me something last night that I, you know, it was this morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I had dozed off. I was like, man, it was still playing. I was yeah. like, this is some dope stuff in the tone. I think you said it was in 432? Yeah. I wrote this thing, and it's called, and, and the pigeons are, are part of, are part of the mantra of the song. And so this thing is called Flight of the Bronze Birds. So I'll just, and it's on this record, it's H-I-M, Healing Instrumental Music. So I realized now that this music I was writing is like healing for me, but I, I was just like, okay, I just gotta get this out. Mm -hmm. But I realized that it's been helpful to me too. I played this for Sweetie, and she was like, she goes, she goes, you're an ecosystem. I just wanted the I just wanted the pigeons. They're, I just said okay. I just gotta mix them in there so that people know that that's like it's the birds are the main focal point. that goes on in my head. <laughs> I've always been outer space. Yeah. Like, like, this is... That's beautiful. Yeah? Like, for real. Yeah.